Stephen, in your book on poetry, The Ode Less Travelled, you write, for me, the private act of writing poetry is songwriting, confessional, diary keeping, speculation, problem solving, storytelling, therapy, anger management, craftsmanship, relaxation, concentration, and spirit, spiritual adventure, all in one inexpensive package. It occurs to me, if that's really true, <laughs> and we could package poetry, um, th this would be of enormous benefit for, for the entire nation, certainly for the National <laughs> Health Service, because it's blimming cheap, as you say. Don't forget the first two words of that quotation. Though. For me. For me, yeah, that's the thing. And, and I'm sure it wouldn't necessarily apply to others. Music may to others, all kinds of other things may um, exercise. You know, I'm a, someone who's been diagnosed as bipolar and... and um, uh, so I've been more, ever since that diagnosis, been very much more attentive to uh, what seems to help or not help my mind. And when I was not diagnosed, I was very inattentive and just did things to feed my mood, um, which was stupid, like drugs and alcohol. But um, y when you stop doing that, things get a bit better, but you still have left these mood issues that anyone with bipolar disorder will have. And so you... You, you value anything that seems to take the, um, the, the, the mania uh, down a, a spot, but also seems to help you when you're feeling very black. And it may just be that I'm someone who has a high doctrine of language and of verbal expression, probably as a result of being physically inept and not being able to sing or play musical instruments or paint, so it's all I've got left. Um, but therefore, at least, it seems language and poetry, which is one takes to be the highest expression uh, of language, uh, is, is a natural way for me to both to, to grapple with demons but also to, to escape from them. Um, actually, using the word demons is interesting. W.H. Auden, a great um, poetic hero of mine, uh, when asked whether he would get rid of his demons, through poetry said, no, no, I don't want to get rid of my demons or my angels will fly away too. And I don't know whether that's true, but certainly because you can express ideas in an unusual way when you're a poet, you can express your feelings, the turbulence within you, you can go beyond the usual descriptive words like storm or whatever they might be and find other, uh, other ways of describing how you feel or confronting how you feel. Um, and poetry, I think, al allows that better than most things. And the process for you, I'm, I'm just guessing it might involve a notebook and a pencil? Very much so, yeah. The standard moleskin and pencil approach. Um, uh, again, W.H. Auden at his best in, uh, in, I think it's in The Dyer's Hand, which is a collection of his uh, essays and criticism, and he writes about how to be a poet. Um, and he says, uh, all poets generally like their own handwriting. It's like smelling your own farts, he said. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's helpful. But anyway, yes, I like my handwriting. Uh, um, I'm very fond of typing on computers, but not for poetry. It seems, seems the direct transmission from the, through the brain to the hand, to the, the eye as you write, um, is, is important. Um, and... I'll, you know, I'll be honest, when trouble is when, when, when one's depressed, the first thing to go from is energy. Well, that was the next thing I was going to ask, that um, the, you know, often people when they're depressed would, would say, well, I, I couldn't even pick up a book, no. uh, couldn't even sort of read the newspaper, l let alone read something as demanding as a poem, let alone do something as demanding as, as sit down and write. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think I've ever written a poem when I'm depressed. But what I have done, what I've learned to do, and I don't know if it's helpful for anybody else, is to write down words, just individual words. It doesn't matter what they are. And they can be very, very odd. I mean, in a basket or something, or, or tiles or something. They don't seem necessarily to be connected with how one's feeling, but they're just words that are in one's head. You write them down, you write them as many as you can. Um, and then maybe when, with any luck, it isn't too, too far away, some sort of, change or stabilization comes over you and you have a little bit more energy and you can look at those pages and you can think oh that's interesting and you can actually find a way of putting them together what about 
sort of reciting words or even lines mm. of poems in your head. We, uh, one of the people we've spoken to for this course is Rachel Kelly, um, who's written a wonderful book about how poetry helped her through depression. And for her, um, there was something about the sort of the repetition of lines of poetry that were sort of ingrained in her memory that, that were just gave her something to hold on to. Is that an experience you've ever had? Completely. I, I, I have s certain lines. There's one that never leaves me. Um, Keats lines, and Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. Um, I, I'd say that, it's, it's a, I don't know what it is, it's, it's, it's a sort of touchstone for me. Um, it's a rather amazing line, um, the progression, progression of L's and D's that go it's symmetrically through. <laughs> it's a, um, and I kind of hug myself if I'm really low, and I go, Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. Um, it, partly I, I have a picture, it creates a total picture, and a lot of Keats does, of course because um, he was very inspirational for pre-Raphaelite artists mm. and things, and you can see Madeleine asleep in lap of legends old, and it's a, comfort, it's a comforting idea. I don't know, I'm sure a psychiatrist could explain why that particular line is the one that I always say. But yeah, the, the part of the pleasure of poetry is the crunch and feel of words in your mouth and, uh, as they hit the tip of the tongue and they, they resound, and um, it's, it's important, I think, to... Yeah, to enjoy all of those. Sometimes, um, sometimes you uh, you have a kind of equivalent of photosensitivity or audio sensitivity in which everything's too loud or everything's too. Uh, and poetry is the last one to be an annoyance, I find, in quite the way that other things are, like like music or even pictures, can be annoying to you. I've got a passage here from the poet Robert Frost. Uh, Frost was a depressive. He had a pretty tough life. His, his, his father died of TB when he was 11. His mother died of cancer when he was 26. His mother had depression. He had depression. His wife had depression. Uh, his only son committed suicide. One of his daughters died of cholera when she was eight. Another daughter died in childbirth. Another daughter he had to commit to a mental hospital. I mean, it's a pretty grim Apart life. Apart from that, life was fine. Apart from that, and his life friend was Edward, fine. Edward Thomas. <laughs> well, his friend Edward Thomas was equally depressed, and then, as you say, was killed in, yeah. in, in the war. But um, Frost was a great believer in the importance of poetic form. Mm. He famously said that he 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 says I'd sooner write free verse as play tennis with the net down. You sort of you, you need the net for a good game of tennis, and Frost believed you needed form in order to craft a, a, a poem. He wrote a wonderful little short three-line poem. It's called Pertinax. It goes, let chaos storm, let cloud shapes swarm, I wait for form. <laughs> and the, uh, the, 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 the rhyme gives him the form. Um, but it, he reflected once about the importance of form. Um, he, he says, we see forms in nature all around us. And then he says, when we are in doubt, there is always form for us to go on with. Anyone who has achieved form is lost to the larger excruciations. I think it must stroke faith the right way. The artist, the poet, might be expected to be the most aware of such assurance, but it is really everybody's sanity to feel it and live by it. Mm. And I thought that was a, a wonderful phrase that somehow creating form, he, he goes on and gives examples of weaving a basket, writing a letter, making a garden, um, putting the furniture in your room in a good order, or above all, writing a poem. Those are all things that give form mm. to the chaos of life. And somehow it is everybody's sanity to live and feel by it. And that somehow if you can achieve form, then the larger excruciation, yeah. which is presumably sort of doubt about the meaning of life, in a sense, can, can disappear. D does that resonate with it, you? It does. It reminds me also of, the idea of Seamus Heaney's idea of drilling the potatoes, you know, the getting the, that, that, that order, that sense of, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people will relate to that. And the idea of tidying your desk, tidying your room, it goes all the way back to when you were a child. There's something to do with the anxiety and the terror and the guilt of being a child and with a messy bedroom um, that you just stick with it, it gets worse and worse. And then, then eventually you have this frenzied attempt to tidy it. Um, and you, there's a belief, though, that you, you invest so much in the idea of order around you in order to be able then to progress to creativity. But it doesn't always work like doesn't that. doesn't always work. Um, that I'm, re I'm reminded also of um, Freud's great comment. Um, wherever I go, I find a poet has been there before me. It's 
wonderful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, and and it, it's a sort of modern version of poets being the unacknowledged legislators of the world. They are actually, there's something about poetry does take you to places, whether it's order, I suppose the act of making a poem is, is an act of order, it's an act of defiance to the turbulence that, mm -hmm. so even if it isn't in exactly a, um, in form, it's a little like Ted Hughes's famous thought fox. There's the white page or the white uh, lawn um, and you print, you make a difference, you, you make something. It's suddenly there, it wasn't there before. This idea has, 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 has all your, all the, the maelstrom has focused, the tornado has focused into a point which is actually quite still and it's writing on the page. There's that huge, huge churning tornado and it's actually a pen and it's just focused down into a sort of stillness, quietness. Um, the, the other quote that I love, a little bit like the Freud one, is, uh, is, is Keats again. We seem to have talked a lot about yeah. Keats, but um, he says that um, a, a, a poem should strike us, uh, strike us, the reader, as a wording of our own highest thoughts and almost a remembrance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's brilliant. It's that, yes, that's what it mm -hmm. means. That's how it is. That's how I feel. I, I sort of remember that, but I've never been able to word those highest thoughts. Yes, at the end of all our... <laughs> exactly, it is. Um, yeah, there is that strange feeling, yes, to have arrived at the place we started and to know it for the first time. And mm. poets can refresh mm. uh, an experience completely, like, um, and yet it's something we've always known. And it is a, a, a tremendous thing that all art can do, but I think poets do it somehow better than anyone is is to take you to a place that you've always known mm -hmm. and you've never dared go or you've never realised was available for you to go. And it's, oh, it's okay. There's a kind of acceptance. It, it is, and, and when, you're, when you're reading the poem, when you're in the poem, you're, you're in that place, in that moment, and a lot of other things just, just fall away. They do. They absolutely do. I, w I wish I could say that I had a list of poems or poets who are good for depression or good for mania or good for any kind of mental uh, uh, dis-ease. Um, I, do, I don't think it quite, quite works like that. I think, I think one can be tremendously solaced or comforted by a poem that's just charming and sweet, about nothing too terrible, or one can be incredibly depressed by such a poem because it's, oh, it's too pretty, you know? Um, so I don't think there's a rule. Um, as far as I can tell, there isn't a rule. I, 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 it would obviously be something that a, in, in our culture, a publisher would say, come on, I want a book. I want an anthology of books for people with mental, you know, and you go, no, come on, it doesn't work. It doesn't like work that. quite It really like doesn't. It would, yeah. be a, it would be an act of betrayal and dishonesty to suggest that there were poems that work because it, it's so personal. Uh, both mental health problems, you know, uh, bipolar disorder is personal and poems are personal. So. Stephen, I asked you to um, come along and talk about a couple of poems that have helped you in dark times. And slightly to my surprise, um, you chose two poems that are pretty melancholy. Um, John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale and uh, Philip Larkin's Obard. Uh, the Keats poem written uh, at the time his, 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 his brother Tom uh, has died of tuberculosis and Keats is anxious about his own health, his mood is very dark, um, but he, he's just sitting uh, and he has a nightingale. And then the Larkin one, it's one of those waking at four o'clock in the morning moments, feeling pretty, pretty glum about life. Uh, it was one of the last poems that Larkin wrote. He, he really struggled with writer's block towards the end of his life. Um, so these, these, these dark, melancholic poems, do, but do they cheer you up? Oddly enough, they do. I suppose it's because there's, so, there's an authenticity about it. They have really been to places that I've been, but they've made something of it, something permanent and remarkable, to incredible poems. Yes, Larkin was a rather, rather downcast, miserableist. Um, but this poem, it's so beautiful. It, he took a long time to write it, and you know that every single line is beautifully shaped, perfectly made, yet not for the sake of artifice and, and delight, but just because he knows no other way. This is the way he writes poems. This is the way poems for him work, is to be perfect 
And, and, and so the, the images of the light seeping through the curtains and the outline of the wardrobe, is, it's incredible. And then the, the angry old man uh, comes through with his, his rage about religion, which is fantastically expressed. This idea that death is death is death. There is nothing else. And I have to face that. And I'm getting nearer it all the time. And then this kind of brilliant sort of Ordnesque ending with the telephones and the postman going. Uh, a postman coming from house to house like doctors. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It, it's just a brilliant poem. And the other thing about it, you're talking about its perfect crafting, is it's one of those poems that when you read it, you don't notice that it rhymes. That's right. But in fact, it has got a fantastically complex uh, rhyme scheme. It's a, they're, they're ten line stanzas, and um, the, you know, you've got the first quatrain uh, with uh, the, the ABBA, yeah. then you've got a rhyming couplet, and then you've got BAAB, -B, or maybe it's the other way yeah, around. But it, you right. know, it's amazingly crafted. And yet, you could, you could read it, and it, it feels conversational. It does not feel like rhyme, or, and, and the rhythm, again, is, is perfect, but it's not tumpty-tum rhythm. I mean, yeah. quite extraordinary. It does. It argues immense craftsmanship. And yes, as you said, um, towards the end of his life, and that's what the poem's about, um, which is part of the irony of its title, Obard is a French form of poetry which is celebrating the dawn, the, dawn. the beginning of yes. a new day. Yeah. And of course, he's writing yeah. about... The most famous Obard in English literature is the great uh, sequence in Romeo... Well, Romeo oh, and Juliet, yeah, when they're awaking, yeah. it was the nightingale, it was not the lark. You know, the, it's the idea of the dawn of the new day. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of John's John. busy old fool, busy old unruly fools. son. Yeah, yeah. Same, same trope. Yeah, yeah. but it's, a, uh, yeah, it's, it's an, uh, an amazing piece of work. Uh, and I think... Um, it is as great a testament to him as a man and a poet uh, as there ever was. Um, and I do find it, therefore, uplifting. Mm. Although it's about death, it's honest about death. Well, the Keats is also about death, but whereas Larkin says death is death and that's all there is, what Keats says is, well, actually, there is something that can outlive death, which is beauty. The song of the nightingale, he says, is the same as the, as the song of the nightingale heard by Ruth in the Old Testament, heard in distant lands, distant ages. And of course, the nightingale is very much a traditional figure of, of the poet, the poetic art of music. I mean, there have been poems about nightingales ever since the ancient Greeks. Oh, yes. So Keats is in a way saying, we can actually cheat death, we can cheat melancholy through art, through poetry. Yes. And although Larkin doesn't say that, of course, in a way he does, because here we are with Larkin dead and his poem alive. Exactly right. And that's the joy, the transcendent joy of poetry. Um, I mentioned it m before when we were talking about Shakespeare's famous 18th sonnet and, 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 you know, so long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Um, and and it's, it, it, it's something that Larkin played with uh, both in terms of his own poetry and in the famous Arundel tomb poem about the old couple, medieval couple, holding hands, which is sort of unbearably charming and beautiful mm -hmm. poem. It's just so lovely what the... What will survive of us is love, but actually what survives is the art. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And si similarly with Keats, uh, the beauty is truth, truth, beauty. There's all you need to, all you know in this world, all you need to know. Um, but we don't all have his ability to transmit beauty. We don't, but we can, we can all share it. I mean, just thinking of the Shakespeare sonnet again, you know, um, so, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. The great thing about Shakespeare's sonnet is that he, he doesn't actually give us the name of his lover. Uh, in fact, he may have had many lovers, I'm sure he did. Um, but we as readers can possess that poem. We can read it to our lover yes. and say, this gives life to thee. There's that sense that when we possess a poem, it no longer belongs to the poet. It belongs to us and it becomes something very precious for us. I think that's right, and I think that is an almost a definition of a great artist of any kind, is that they befriend their reader or their beholder, if they're a painter, or their listener, if they're a musician, that they welcome you into their world. Very often when we're young, we grow up scared of the names of the big artists. They're what, what <laughs> a teacher, English teacher at my school called the big guns. <laughs> That's how I thought of them. <laughs> you know, especially if they were foreign names like Dostoevsky or something, you'd think, oh, these are not for me. And I think when one discovers a poem and a poet, you realize that they're grabbing you by the, they're encircling you and they're taking you in and f f forever from then on you will be part of their world, part of their, their creation, part of their achievement, part of their way of looking at things, it w and it will never leave you. And that's an astonishing thing.
In W. H. Jordan's great elegy on the death of his fellow poet W. B. Yeats, w. B. Yeats he says, when Yeats dies, he's, he has this wonderful line, he became his admirers, that uh, yes, he, so right. he, his work lives on in foreign cities through his readers. Stephen Fry, thank you so much for talking to us. Such a pleasure, Jonathan. <laughs>